Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Annabella Maria Galang, and I'm the Chair of Symposium for Cornell Undergraduate Research Board. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the keynote speaker uh, for this year's Spring Symposium. This evening, we have Dr. Leonard Zahn. Dr. Len Zahn is the Grausbeck Professor of Pediatric Medicine at Harvard Medical School, an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and the director of the Stem Cell Program at Boston Children's Hospital. He received a BS in Chemistry and Natural Sciences from Muhlenberg College and an MD from Jefferson Medical College. He subsequently did an internal medicine residency at New England Deaconess Hospital and a fellowship in medical oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. It is without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Lanzon. Thank you for being here today. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks for everybody for coming out tonight. Um, let me just uh, share my screen here. And if you could tell me if it looks good. It looks great. Thank you. Awesome. So um, what I thought I would do today is to share some reflections on going through a career, um, particularly as I... Uh, uh, went through medicine all the way to a professor. And um, I'm going to illustrate this through my science. Um, but uh, I think there'll be a lot of life lessons here that I'm hoping you'll enjoy. Um, and so I'm going to cut my lecture a tiny bit short because we started a little bit later, but I think it should be uh, leave time for questions. Um, so um, I've spent my entire life uh, working on blood stem cells. And uh, it turns out that you make your blood inside your bones in the bone marrow, and there's a constant influx and efflux of blood stem cells. And these stem cells have the ability to self-renew, they can make themselves, or they can differentiate into cells. And this process is helped by uh, what we call the niche or the environment. There are blood vessels there, there are fibroblasts that are called stromal cells, and even the bone cells help this process. And we know this works really well because somebody can have a bone marrow transplant and uh, one transplant is able to cure them. Um, and, uh, but the, about 25% of patients die from the transplant. And so we've been trying to understand the blood system and trying to make it more safe. So in this um, field, um, we have this quote, which is lineage matters. So you have a blood stem cell and the blood stem cell makes progenitors and the progenitors make precursors to these blood cell types. For instance, the red blood cells that carry your oxygen, the white blood cells that fight infection and the lymphocytes uh, that are important. But one of the things um, that I always think about is um, that lineage actually matters in terms of where you went for training and who you trained with. And I actually trained with a professor, Stuart Orkin, uh, actually at Boston Children's. And um, he became a mentor for me. And it's very, very important to have excellent mentors. And you can actually trace his lineage tree all the way through a couple Nobel Prize winners. And so it's really helpful to have these messages that come through down the generation. And I think one of the things that you should be looking for is very good mentors to help you in your career. Now, when I was a postdoc um, in Stu's lab, I cloned um, a DNA binding protein called GATA1. And GATA1 is a zinc finger DNA binding protein. And there are GATA sites actually in every single red blood cell gene. Um, and so what this means is that it controls the entire red blood cell program. So this is a really exciting molecule and we published a very important paper. And while I was doing this, um, I was, um, this was me, um, I hate to say it, probably about 33 or four years uh, before uh, we are now. And um, it came at one point that I was trying to clone GATA1 and I had a tube of bacteria. And one of the bacterias was GATA1. And I had been able to pick a few bacteria and see if it was the right thing, but it never was the right thing. And it was somehow hiding from me. So in one day, what I decided to do was to pick um, 1100 bacterial clones. I made DNA from each of these tubes. And then I transfected the DNA into a cell line and did an assay on that cell line to find the clone. 
and I was successful and it just tells you that sometimes brute force is necessary. So you just have to do it. Now, once I um, cloned this transcription factor, this DNA binding protein, um, I found something that was quite interesting. It was expressed in where this box is. So it was in the progenitors and the precursors and these mature cells, uh, the red cells, the megakaryocytes, the platelets, and the eosinophils, the allergy producing cells, but it really wasn't expressed very much in the stem cell. And so I thought something has to turn on this particular gene to start making red blood cells. And so when I started my own laboratory, I decided I wanted to figure out what that was, what turns on the red blood cell program. So I thought a lot about it and I decided that I was going to do mouse genetics because really this problem was how do you make blood? And we know that embryos know how to make blood. And so if you look at a seven and a half day mouse embryo, you can see the blood islands, okay, over here. And at 10 and a half days, you can see the fetal liver where the blood cells are being made. And so I had never worked on um, mice uh, before uh, during my postdoc, but I decided to um, that we were gonna be a mouse genetics lab. And so um, I went over to um, a mouse lab over at MIT and I started dissecting out mouse embryos at seven and a half days. And again, I'd never seen this before, so I didn't know what to expect, but it took us six hours. And in six hours, I had six little embryos in a dish. And I realized that all the things I'd wanted to do when I would start my lab working on the mouse wasn't going to be possible. And I was gonna to need to find something else. And I was pretty down about it actually. So I um, came back to the lab and one of my friends was there, Alan Ezekwitz. And Alan um, was chairman of pediatrics at Mass General, and he was a vice president of Merck. Uh, um, and uh, he had this quote, which says, um, science requires thick skin. And I think that this really is true of life. You know, life requires thick skin. You're gonna be thrown a lot of things at you in the future. You may get a bad grade on a test. You may submit a paper and get trashed. Um, for me, I might submit a grant and not get funded. And, you know, the best advice I can give you is to just let it roll over your shoulders because you have thick skin, because these, these things are going to happen over and over again, even uh, after graduating. And, and it's better to just deal with it now. So um, I, went, um, I went down the hallway and I um, saw another friend of mine, Celeste Simon, and actually Celeste is a professor at Penn and actually just got into the National Academy of Sciences. And um, Celeste um, uh, said, you know, wow, you look really terrible. And I said, yeah, you know, I, my entire thought on what I was gonna do my lab was just not gonna work at all. And she says, well, I can't solve that, but I'm having a party at my house. So why don't you come to the party? So I say, great. And I end up at the party and I have a beer in my hand. And this guy walks up to me, Jerry Thompson, who's now a professor at Stony Brook. And he said, uh, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Len Zahn. And he says, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I cloned GATA1. And now I'm trying to figure out what turns GATA1 on during development. And he says, oh, well, you need an externally fertilized animal. And I said, like what? And he said, like a frog. So a frog embryo, um, you can have thousands from one frog, you know, and you can have a one cell embryo, a two cell, four cell, and eventually you'll make blood. And it would be a great system if you started studying frog blood development. And he said, you know, the frog has blood cells, just like humans, all those, you know, red cells, white cells, platelets, they're all there. So he said, you should come and talk to my mentor, uh, Doug Melton, and he would be interested in helping you start this. So I made an appointment with Doug Melton and I started uh, working on frogs, frog blood development. So here's um, a picture of the blood islands of a tadpole. And you can see here, it's in the bottom or the ventral side of the tadpole. Now it turns out that there's tissue called mesoderm. And this is the most ventral mesoderm. So there was excitement about working on frogs. 
And around this time in 1995, I decided to write a review on the developmental biology of blood development. We call it hematopoiesis. And in there, I said that the factors that regulate blood stem cell homeostasis may closely resemble the inducers of embryonic patterning rather than the factors that stimulate the proliferation and differentiation of the cells. And I said, it would be really cool to have comparative study between of embryonic hematopoiesis in lower vertebrates, and it could generate testable hypotheses that similar mechanisms occur uh, during hematopoiesis in higher species. So that ended up being true. So I was very happy and very lucky at that point. So now I have one of my early postdocs, and Paul Mead, and he's at St. Jude's right now. And he cloned a homeobox gene that was required for blood development. And when he injected this gene, Mix.1, into a tadpole, um, it turned the whole animal into a blood island. So it was really expanding a lot of blood. And um, this um, you know, was ultimately published and was very exciting. And I was excited about it too, but at the time, the frogs, um, it took about nine months for a frog to mature to a sexually active um, stage. And so it was taking too long to do the experiments and there was no genetics. And I needed to do genetics because genetics are really fascinating. And so I uh, <clears throat> decided to switch from one lower vertebrate, the, the frog, all the way up to the uh, zebrafish. So I'm always asked, um, how did you get into zebrafish? And um, I had an amazing week, okay? So in um, 1992, I attended a hemoglobin switching meeting. And actually it's pretty funny, now I'm in charge of this meeting. But um, I attended as a you know, junior uh, beginning investigator and I gave my lecture on frogs. And one of the guys there, who's a very senior person, uh, Frank Grossfeld, came up to me and he said, you know, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And he said, you know, I think you're doing great work on the frog, but have you thought about doing zebrafish? Because zebrafish have genetics and that's going to be very exciting. And he actually spent an hour with me at a meeting and really felt like I should switch. And, you know, I think one of the things that you'll find out, sometimes you'll end up in a conversation with somebody somewhere else that you don't even know. And that conversation could change your entire life, a whole project. And so you should make sure you stay in that conversation, even if you have some major event to get to, just stay in that conversation and enjoy it. So I was excited about zebrafish. And then um, I came back to my office and there was a phone call. And the phone call was from Bill Dietrich, who is a professor at Northeastern University. And he works on the Antarctic ice fish. He spends three months a year in Antarctica. And what happened is the ice fish swam down to Antarctica from Northern areas. And when it got there, it deleted its blood cell genes. So it has no red blood cells and it diffuses all of its oxygen through its skin. And it may not do very well with exercise, but it actually survives pretty well. And he wanted to study the Antarctic ice fish in my lab. And I said, I don't really care about Antarctic ice fish, but what about zebrafish? And he said, sure, I'd be really happy to do a sabbatical in your lab. So I had my first person one day after this meeting. And then another day went by and another lab, Wally Gilbert's lab called me and Wally had won the Nobel prize for DNA sequencing. And he said um, they had a bloodless zebrafish mutant that they were working on, but they don't want it anymore. And we, they thought maybe I might want it. So within a week, somebody upstairs was telling me, go do zebrafish. So this is a zebrafish. Um, you can buy them in a pet store. They're about one and a half inches in size. And I, I have 300,000 zebrafish at Boston Children's Hospital. That's almost a level you can do population genetics on it. So the zebrafish is really cool. The embryos are completely transparent. The circulation starts at 23 hours. And we've made transgenic fish that have every single blood cell in a different color. The adults, each mother, has 100 to 200 babies every week. You know, they say child, you know, child care is expensive for fish here. 
And um, you can do genetic screens, you can do genetic knockdowns, you can add chemicals to the water and see very interesting things happen. And the blood program is very well conserved to humans. Here is a four cell embryo, and now it's eight cells, 16 cells, 32 cells. And the future brain is actually on the right side over here. And you're gonna see it kind of go down over this yoke, which is the nutrient supply. There you go, it's going down. Then it comes back up. And now we'll see up top, the future eye will develop right now. Okay, there you go. You can see the eye, the somites, which are the muscles form, and the tail lifts off. And so that animal is 19 hours old. And that animal has almost all of its organs. So if you think about a 19 hour old zebrafish embryo, it relates really well to a 28 day old human embryo. And the thought that we had is if we understood the zebrafish embryo, that we would have an idea of how uh, the human embryos are put together. So um, Don Wiley was a famous X-ray crystallographer and a friend of mine here at Harvard. And he said, you could, it's very easy to get talked out of a good experiment. And he was absolutely true. Here I am, and you know, I wanted to do zebrafish. It has great genetics, and I'll explain that in a second. Really good developmental biology, as I've showed you. The embryos are transparent. They're externally fertilized, so I'm just gung-ho. But my colleagues were thinking it's a little weird to have a doctor start doing zebrafish work. Um, and they had a lot of questions and these questions were really penetrating. How many mutants, I wanted to make mutant fish that didn't have blood, how many will I actually get? How will I clone the genes? Will you ever find anything new? Will you ever find a gene that relates to stem cells or even early blood development? And these questions were super penetrating. It was really hard for me because I didn't have any defense because we were just starting. So if I would have listened to all my colleagues, I probably wouldn't have started the zebrafish work at all. But I think it's very important if you're passionate about something, it's really important to just go do it. And the other thing I would say is I'm always interested, um, you know, I may have an undergrad in my lab and you think, oh, well, that undergrad doesn't have much experience. But if you were to project that undergrad 30 years later, maybe they won the Nobel Prize. So they might be really brilliant. So you might be better than some of the people who are giving you advice. It's just, you need experience. So anyway, I went ahead and we did zebrafish. And so what you do is you take a male and you soak him in ethyl nitrosurea. This causes mutations to occur in the sperm or spermatogonia. And then we mate this fish into different generations. And then in the F3 generation, we look for usually autosomal recessive where a quarter of the animals have no blood. And it worked out really, really well. Um, this is a normal fish and this is the heart. And so what you can see is the heart beating. And I hope you can see it's beating a pink fluid. The pink fluid was the red blood cells. But then we got a mutant like this. Okay, the heart's beating and it's pumping blood cells. This animal has pretty good number of blood cells, but these blood cells are not pink. So, so this fish has a globin problem like sickle cell anemia or another disease thalassemia. Then we had this mutant. This mutant's pumping serum or plasma, but has no blood cells whatsoever. And this mutant has a stem cell defect. So it was super exciting and we started getting all these mutants and um, we started to classify them about when they started to have a phenotypic problem. So we had early mutants that affected that tissue mesoderm. We had later mutants that affected stem cells or progenitors. And then we had mutants that affected the red blood cells. Now around this time, they told me from the zebrafish community, you need to name your mutants. And so we decided because there are red and white blood cells and red and white wines, we decided to name them after wines. 
So here's Zinfandel, Chianti, Chardonnay, Chablis, Riesling, Sauterne, Retsina, Weisserbst, Ecam, et cetera. And the uh, thing that's pretty cool is I would, whoever cloned one of these genes, I would buy them a bottle of wine to celebrate. So when somebody cloned a Sauterne, I bought a $100 bottle of Sauterne for my graduate student. Um, but um, this mutant here, Retsina, I never heard of before. So I went to the liquor store and I said, I want your best bottle of Retsina. And they said, well, do you want the half gallon or gallon jug? And so I realized that it's a very cheap Greek wine. And uh, that's what one of my postdocs mutant was gonna get. So then all of a sudden we started to get mutants that had no immune system, had no T cells. And so we decided to name them after teas. So you had chamomile, Darjeeling, Earl Grey, Jasmine, and Assam. So it was pretty fun. So the next thing was, if you followed the logic, um, I was causing point mutations to occur in the sperm. There's billions of base pairs of DNA, and I needed to find the one base pair that was changed in these mutants that was leading to a blood disease. So to do this, I needed to understand something about the genome. So the zebrafish genome is two thirds the size of humans. It has 25 chromosomes. And at the time when I started, Started, there was only one marker per chromosome, very, very low density. And there were no libraries of zebrafish DNA. And it seemed pretty hopeless, I have to say. Um, but I ended up at the uh, American Society of Hematology meeting in 1996 um, with a famous hematologist, George Stamianopoulos. And I, I, said, um, I said, I'm trying to clone these genes. And he says, he says, Zon, you'll never clone these genes. And they're like, oh God, more people who are doubters. He says, the only way you clone these genes is if you convince the NIH to have a zebrafish genome project. And they're like, wow. And he goes, you would have to convince Harold Varmus. So it turns out Harold Varmus um, would often come to our Howard Hughes meetings. And I had a very nice friendship with him and he loved what we were doing with the zebrafish. So I decided to just give him a call which is another lesson. Don't ever be scared of calling the most famous person you ever heard of. And this is me calling the director of the NIH. So um, he said he'd talk to me and I talked to him and he said um, um, here um, to come to the NIH. He says, I suggest you speak very briefly about the benefits of zebrafish since some of the directors are unfamiliar with them. Pass out copies of the report for leisure reading Describe the obstacles to progress, outline the re major recommendations for building the infrastructure <clears throat> that is lacking. Plan to talk for about 20 minutes and don't expect any instant decisions, but I think you'll have an impact, which we will measure in a subsequent meeting. So this was really cool. And um, he was giving me my opportunity and I had the weight of the entire field on my shoulders doing this 20 minute talk. Um, now, there is a, a subplot to this, which is he told me to arrive on a certain Wednesday. And it turned out I play trumpet in an orchestra, uh, the Longwood Symphony. And um, I had a concert that week and Wednesday was the dress rehearsal. So I was trying to decide whether I blow off the dress rehearsal, which meant I couldn't play the concert or whether I should ask the NIH director if I could do another day. So I called him up again and I said, you know, I have a problem. I'm in an orchestra, I play trumpet and uh, Wednesday's our dress rehearsal. And he said, you know, Lenny says, nobody has ever refused anything that I want. I'm surprised that you're doing this. He says, but you're a lucky man. My son plays jazz trumpet in New York. And so I understand and we can do it the next week. So never be scared to ask. So we got, the Trans NIH Zebrafish Initiative, the Sanger Center in England was able to sequence the genome. And we were able to clone all of those genes and find out what the genetic defect was. And it was very exciting. We found many different genes and about five of those genes turned out to be novel at the time. And then we found humans who couldn't make blood correctly and they were mutated in those five genes. And so it was very exciting. We had discovered five new human diseases as a result of our zebrafish. Now, I want to go over a little bit more about our stem cell biology. Um, and 
Um, in stem cell biology, I, I've done a bone marrow transplant on many patients, and it's kind of a little bit anticlimactic. I hang a bag of what looks like blood, but it's bone marrow, and I infuse it into the patient to rescue them after they've been treated with chemotherapy. So let's think about what are those stem cells have to do? Well, I put them into the veins. They need to go home. They need to home to the bone marrow. They need to engraft. So I'm always asked like, what is engraftment? So um, I'm sure finals is about to come up for you. And um, what are you gonna do after your final exam, right? So if you think about it, the day you go home after your final exams, you're like exhausted. So what do you do for the first three days? You sleep, right? And then on day four, you wake up and you're in your own bed and you have that feeling. Well, that's what engraftment is for a blood stem cell. And then a single blood stem cell can make all six pints of blood cells. And it's, so it's very amazing how the self renewal is. And these processes take time as shown here. So one of the things I wanted to discover was a drug that would regulate stem cell production. And these two who are both um, uh, associate nurse or professors at Harvard are, uh, were involved in my lab. So first of all, the zebrafish um, has the initiation of its blood stem cells in this line here, which is the aorta, which is the largest blood vessel of the body. And you can see that the stem cells are born in the ventral side of the aorta. In humans, it's the exact same place. This is the human aorta, and that's exactly where blood cells are made. So that's um, what we're going to try to do is to increase the number of blood stem cells that are produced. So I do my own lab research sometimes, and I wondered what regulates self-renewal. So my lab research was I did a Google search on selfrenewal.com and I found out what self-renewal really is. And it's over here, it's dating, cars, and entertainment. So this is a movie of the birth of a blood stem cell in a zebrafish. So here's a 36 hour embryo and we're gonna dive into the aorta to watch the blood stem cell actually be born. So what you see is a blood vessel cell, we call it an endothelial cell, that changes its shape, and then it rounds up, and that is a blood stem cell. That blood stem cell goes off into circulation, and it's going to go around and around circulation, and it's going to land in a region that can help it make more blood cells. We call this um, the caudal hematopoietic territory or tissue. And this is um, very similar to the fetal liver of a human. The stem cell goes outside the blood vessels and it doubles. And then some of these cells go back into circulation and colonize the marrow. Now in the fish, the marrow is actually in its uh, kidney. And that makes the kidney a blood forming organ, just like your bones are the blood forming organs for humans. Some of the cells bypass the kidney and go to the thymus, and that starts the immune system. And all this lets the animal have blood really throughout its entire lifetime. Now, I always, as a clinician, wanted to see a blood stem cell land in the marrow. But unfortunately, we're all opaque, so I can't see it. So we made a fish that has green stem cells. The stem cells are born green. They go round and around circulation, and then they're going to land. And here in this region, oh, sorry, we'll see the cells land. The cell comes in, it transmigrates out of the blood vessels, and then we see something really weird. The blood vessels actually wrap themselves back around the stem cell. Then the stem cell divides. It makes a turn and one stem cell leaves and the other one stays. And so it's really an amazing behavior. Very, very interesting. We are able to take that animal and do electron microscopy. And this is what the cells look like. A stem cell has five blood vessel cells surrounding it. And the stem cell is physically attached 
to a fibroblast, a stromal cell, and this becomes the surface on which the stem cell actually divides. Now, I wanted to see if we could find a chemical. And so here's those stem cells in the aorta. And we added chemicals to embryos and stained them for stem cells. And we found 35 chemicals that could increase blood stem cells. And the best one was this prostaglandin E2 got a very robust increase in stem cell engraftment. So we then um, wanted to see if this would work in a transplant setting. And um, we made use of a mouse model called a competitive transplant. This is what we call the Porsche of all stem cell assays. So what we do is we take the bone marrow from a red mouse and compete it against the yellow mouse. And what we did is we treated the red marrow and left the yellow marrow untreated. And the stem cells are competitive with each other. We transplant them into an irradiated green mouse and we see by the characteristics on their surface, how much blood comes from the red versus the yellow mouse. And what we saw was a fourfold increase in the number of stem cells that engrafted. And another lab repeated our work and got the same result. So that was very exciting. And we decided to take this into the clinic. We initially treated 12 patients. We actually did a competitive transplant in humans. It hadn't been done before. We had an untreated cord blood, which is a source of blood stem cells. We had a um, I'm sorry, treated cord blood and an untreated one. We put them into the patient. We bled the patient after they were transplanted the DNA from these two cord bloods is different, and we can detect that using a technique called PCR. And um, we were able to show that in 10 out of 12 patients, the treated cord was the one that preferentially engrafted. And actually, we've gone on to treat 150 patients, um, and um, the results look pretty good. We um, have a better engraftment. And most patients who are getting gene therapy trials right now are getting prostaglandin E2. So then I wanted to actually do a transplant on a zebrafish because I transplanted humans when I'm a clinical uh, person. I've transplanted mice, but I hadn't transplanted zebrafish. And so I decided um, that I needed some help. And I was gonna put my entire lab onto this project. So I decided to send a letter back when you sent letters um, to uh, E. Donald Thomas. So E. Donald Thomas won the Nobel prize for zebrafish, uh, uh, sorry, for uh, bone marrow transplant. So um, I told him I wanted to do it in zebrafish and this is the letter I got. He said, he already did the experiment in 1960. He thought it was a good project for two high school seniors who wanted a science project. We got some zebrafish, learned how to get the kidney marrow in a sterile condition and did a few injections. They presented it at a high school science show. However, it was quickly apparent that the project was too complex for the students to complete problems of radiation dose, problems of genetic markers. And at that point, he was too busy with his studies on the dog marrow transplant that won him the Nobel prize that he had to drop the fish project. So it tells you it's very hard to do a novel experiment. Um, but nevertheless, we uh, persevered and we took um, green marrow, transplanted it into an irradiated adult. And what you can see here is all the blood was green. And this is six months after the transplant. So that was very exciting. And we could even transplant the other animal and retransplant it. So it was definitely stem cells existed in the zebrafish. Now about this time, I was a little bit upset because what I'm showing you here is the fin of the zebrafish. And the fin is so thin that you can see through it by a microscope. But I wanted to see the stem cells go to the kidney marrow. And the problem was the stripes of the zebrafish were in the way. So um, one of my postdocs um, invented this fish, Casper, the transparent adult fish. It's a double mutant of some pigment genes. 
and you can see the eggs in this animal, the liver, the heart, you can see the aorta, you can see the bones, you can read the newspaper through this fish. And so this has become an incredible transplant model for us. We were able to do marrow transplants. We're able to put a tumor into this animal and watch the cells metastasize. It's really quite amazing. Now, you know, when you make a transparent fish, it gets picked up by the popular press. So we were on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. And one of my friends um, emailed me and he said, you are famous. And I said, well, you know, yeah, it was nice to have some press coverage and everything. He says, no, no, no. He says, you know, The Tonight Show? And at the time it was The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. In research at the Children's Hospital in Boston have genetically engineered transparent fish, see-through fish. The fish are totally transparent. No, not amazing. Hmm? And you know, Red Lobster is going to jump all over this for their, for their seafood platter. We didn't forget your fish. You're, it's just invisible. They're right there. Just look carefully, sir. You'll see. <laughs> so it does tell you that you can become famous uh, doing zebrafish work. So um, just to finish up, um, I um, wanted to say that we were able to do competitive transplants in the fish. Um, we call this the Dr. Seuss experiment. You have a green fish and a red fish. We take the green fish and we treat the marrow with a chemical. We add in some untreated red fish marrow. We inject it into Casper and you don't need to even bleed the fish. You can just take a picture in the green and red channel and look at what we're trying to find is something that leads to more green. And we found some chemicals, this one 1112 EET, which increases engraftment in fish as well as in mice. And uh, it actually is interesting because um, in the biochemical pathway, arachidonic acid will make the prostaglandins, but arachidonic acid will make these other lipids, eats. And so one of the things that this taught us is that the molecules that actually cause cells to migrate and in graft seem to be lipids. And that was a surprise because we weren't thinking that when we went into this. So we can have a stem cell and it comes around, it lands on the surface of an endothelial cell, it transmigrates into the niche and it has a receptor that needs to get activated to be able to do that. So this molecule comes in, binds to the receptors here, and that triggers a shape change. The cell transmigrates in because of this chemical stimulation. There, um, once it transmigrates, it starts to interact with the environment. And those blood vessels start to wrap around the stem cell. We call this endothelial cuddling. And so the endothelial cells or the blood vessel cells will cuddle the stem cell. It'll bring it next to a fibroblast, a stromal cell, and this will use this surface for a division to actually happen. And you'll see the division. There you go. So I'm gonna skip ahead for one thing just to finish off. Um, sorry, great. And um, you know, what I can say is that the zebrafish has helped uh, define cancer biology and blood cells. Uh, zebrafish can be used to study many tumor models, many different types of tumors. We have work on neutrophils, on monocytes, on allergy-produced cells, mast cells, or platelets. We can study the innate or adaptive immunity or vascular biology. So a lot is actually being done in the fish field. I want to tell you it's very, very important to develop mentors. And these are my mentors that I've had really throughout my entire life. Um, when I went to medical school, I worked in this person's lab, Alan Urslev. There was a young assistant professor, Jaime Caro, and they became my mentors. It was actually Alan who suggested when I went to Jefferson Medical College that I go to Boston if I wanted to do academic hematology. I went to Stu Orkin's lab. I talked about him in terms of the lineage. <clears throat> Sam Lux was my chairman for many years, David Nathan also, um, also some friends who were very helpful. And so picking up mentors are really, really helpful. And you should uh, try to get four or five mentors all along your career. It will really help you. These are all the people um, who actually have done the work in my lab and 
I'm certainly appreciative of everybody and Annabella, you know that the lab is a really wonderful place. Now I'm just gonna leave you um, with two things. One is um, this quote that um, when I was having trouble in the lab, it said the academic system has a way of rewarding persistence. And I will often tell my people this, but another is that perseverance is a great substitute for talent. And this is a comedian, Steve Martin. And then being a trumpet player, I always like to uh, end on a high note. So this is uh, Summon the Heroes, um, which is appropriate during uh, the COVID crisis. Great. I'm very, I'm sorry, very happy to take questions and uh, thank you very much for the great opportunity. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Lynn. Really appreciated that. Um, at this point, I want to open up the floor to any questions people might have. Oh, yes, I see lots of virtual round of applause. <laughs> If you'd like, the chat is open. Happy to talk about any questions, career, anything. I think I see. Um, oh, Yo Yochi. Yep. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Yoki. Yoki's fine. Yoki. Um. That was really good. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just had. A, I was really interested in, like, increasing the amount of blood stem cells using the drug treatment, and I was wondering, like, are these stem cells like 100% okay and functional? Can they turn into all the different kinds of blood cells or is there any kind of like difference between that and a normally not like induced? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. So, you know, we were concerned that we may be altering something, but it turns out not at all. And when we treat the patients with prostaglandin, they do uh, really well and they have, uh, you know, better blood recovery early on, but basically it doesn't have any trouble in terms of their differentiation. So we're somewhat lucky that we found a drug that can increase stem cells without causing any really detrimental effects. Good question. We have a, a question from the current president actually. Um, and Ananya is asking, how do you get important people to talk to you as a student that is getting started in a research career? Yeah, it's really great. Well. You know, I think you don't, you want to put yourself in a position of power. And, you know, if a student emails me, it's really hard to not answer them. And I think that's true for most professors. And so, you know, if you want to contact somebody for a reason, there's absolutely no problem. They will likely um, answer you if you've posed it in the right way. So I think, you know, I always believe in asking for advice. So if you write to somebody and say, I just want your advice. And, um, you know, I even have to remind myself sometimes, you know, I'm a full professor. I have a chair at Harvard and everything. And sometimes I'm still thinking, well, why didn't I just ask for advice? Because then the person would get on the phone and talk to me. So I think that's the best um, way of approaching things. Um, it comes up very, very frequently, um, you know, Later in life, if somebody goes and starts their own lab, one of the best things you can do is to ask a, your chair or a, a senior investigator to read your grant. And it's amazing how few people try to find somebody to read your, read your work because it, you can get incredible feedback as a result of that. So um, again, I'd say, don't be scared. Um, you know, You may not hear from them, 
but you might hear from them. And if it does, it works really well. Pose your questions appropriately and always ask for advice. The other thing I would say is you, you have a number of times when you're giving a, a lecture or a talk or a, or a paper, and if somebody has an interesting comment, one of your professors, let's say, you can always go to them and ask, oh, I really thought that comment was interesting. Could you tell me more about what you're thinking? And that's a really good way of picking up mentors because if you um, every year go back to that type of person, if you thought the interaction was good, then I think it really works well. Thank you for that thorough uh, answer. Um, an additional question, um, you mentioned that it's easy to be talked out of a good research idea. How do you balance self-determination and listening to others? Yeah, so one way is your heart will tell you the answer. So, and then the other is a little bit of a logic. Um, so what happens is, um, and I always tell this story, the Eats story was published in Nature. And it was by one of my graduate students, and she's really a spectacular researcher, Pu Lin Lee. And uh, she actually now is a assistant professor at MIT at the Whitehead. So she's done really, really well. But when she came in uh, to work up the competitive transplant assay, in the first couple of days in the lab, she was very excited about that project. And then what she did is went into the lab and started to talking to all the postdocs. And they told her she was crazy. It was gonna be way too much work and she would never graduate because it would take so long. So then when she came to my lab, which came into my office, I had to say like, what happened? Last week you were so excited. This week, you know, obviously they talked you out of the experiment. And, um, you know, we kind of went through the logic and said, you know, is it really that much work to do this? And, and once you go through the logic and see it's not really that bad, then I think it's possible to do this. So um, obviously um, getting advice from others is super helpful, but you gotta watch out. You may be the better scientist, even though you have less experience. And so follow your heart. Speaking of that journey into higher levels of science, um, I have a question here and it's, what are you looking for in undergrads that want to go to PhD programs straight out of college? I would say a lot, you know, a lot of PhD students go straight. Um, and so um, I think that works extremely well. So the most important thing for going straight is your letters of recommendation. So as many of you know, for plenty of schools, the GREs are no longer even required for graduate school for many, many schools, including Harvard. Now, when, when that happened, our application went up 30% because people who probably were going to do well on that test actually uh, decide to come anyway. But, um, you know, I think the, um, um, you're going to be asked to have your letters of recommendation. And those letters need to be quite good to get into a PhD program. And um, so the first thing, if you drop back and think about your letters, the first thing is, you know, who are you going to work with? And this would be true in the humanities and in the sciences is you need to make really good decisions to get good mentors, you know, no matter who, where you're doing it. And so if you have a good mentor who's going to write good letters, then that ends up being a very defining thing. Because I was on the admissions committee of Harvard PhD program for seven years. And I can tell you the letters were the most defining thing. Now, sometimes, you know, some people will go work at a biotech company. Sometimes they don't write as extensive letters at a biotech company as an academic would do it. Um, so if I had my druthers, I would tell you to do an academic research position during your summers or, or, um, or somewhere at Cornell do it um, academically. But you wanna look for the best mentors who are gonna write the best letters. And then, um, you know, when you come and interview, um, it's really just a question of, is the person who was talked about in the letters, the person who's showing up? And I always think it's funny um, people come sometimes unprepared. Um, you should give your, you know, little elevator pitch to several of your friends before you show up. Uh, it shouldn't, I shouldn't be the first professor to hear your elevator pitch. And so sometimes people interview and they just are very unprepared and then it, it doesn't work out for them. But I'm, I think if you get good letters and then you understand your material that you're working on, you'll, you'll get in. Wonderful. Thank you. And as our last question, we have someone asking about your um, 
your recent publication about using zebrafish as avatars for patients. Could you speak a little bit about the science and how that came about? Sure, absolutely. So um, I didn't get a chance to show you all the cancer research we do in the lab. So one of the things that we're uh, really excited about is we've been able to make genetic models of melanoma, which is a skin cancer. And we've been able to study how that skin cancer spreads, what are the genes that initiate the tumor, and also um, you know, how to prevent the tumor and drug treat and things like that. And so that's been very exciting. The avatars are quite amazing. So um, one of my ex postdocs has made zebrafish that don't have an immune system. And you can take a human tumor and transplant it into a zebrafish. And even though the temperature is not quite right, this postdoc has raised the temperature of a fish slowly and got them to a point where they'll accept human cells. And then you can drug treat the human cells in the zebrafish to see if it works. And he's been able to demonstrate that for many therapies, the things that work in a, in a um, human will work in a fish. And so it's a, we decided to write that review, which is um, highlighting uh, the power of the fish in studying cancer. Um, you know, you can have 70 animals with cancer in, in front of you. And, and then to be able to check out, um, to put human tumors into fish as a way of studying them. So it's cost effective and very interesting. That is fascinating. Thank you so much for your time and for going through and answering these questions with us today. Um, thank you everyone for coming and I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap this up. I wanna let all of the presenters here know that you, oh, pardon me. Can we have a virtual round of applause for Dr. Zahn? <laughs> Yay, you can't hear, but you thank can Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, and so I wanted to inform all of the presenters here that you will be hearing from us later this evening by 10 p.m. at, at the latest, um, whether or not you will be invited tomorrow's invite only round for spring symposium. And we will be looking forward to hearing from all of you then. Um, thank you for, for joining us this evening, Dr. Zahn. My pleasure and good luck to everybody. And I hope finals goes well. <laughs> thank you. Have a good evening. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye, everyone.